Yeah, there's a there's a whole lot that actually goes along with this particular um message in this particular time. Seeing that today, now, is uh, is Shabbat Eve. In other words, it's the beginning of the Shabbat. So we'll say Shabbat Shalom, Sen Bet Salam Lehulacho, Be Nugusen Negest, Ena Be Getachin Naba Yesus Christo Sim. Um, peaceful Sabbath to all of our brothers and, and sisters and mothers, to, to all of the the family of the King of Kings and His Christ, especially at this particular time, seeing that this is a leap, this is known as a leap year. We're in a leap year. That means that the, the five days that usually are, are um, is the 13th, that make up the 13th Ethiopic month, these five extra days. And there's an ancient Egyptian link as well, too, but what we want to do is keep most of the majority of this message um, focused on some of the elements of what is being revealed and happening right now. For, for example, we're about to move into a, a, a Sabbath time, but the majority of folks are, especially our people, law sheep, as Brother Umar Abdullah Johnson in a recent video with um, Professor Griff that we've seen, or at least we've seen a por portion of it recently, um, I was reminded by that Umar, Brother Umar, he said, um, they don't want our people, basically I'm paraphrasing, but they don't want our people to be um, thinking on the Sabbath. They want us to be drinking, you understand, so-called smoking and drinking on the Sabbath. Now, as far as the Aishans goes, the herb, and there's much that we have to also touch and connect on that. Um, this is my old minister, I don't know, I'm love. Mm. Abe, 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 too. Ante Borukne. Amen. Uh, ante Ata 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 Adonai. Baruch Ata Adonai. As we said in the Hebrew, in other words, you are blessed, O Adonai, who gives us the fruit of the herb. He gives us the fruit of the herb, of the of the tree the, that bears fruit. You understand? The fruitful tree. This is what he has given us ever since the beginning. So this is part of our. um our sacrament, you understand, but it's not all about this, you understand, it is about this when it's connected with all of that, you understand, all of Yah, when it's connected with all of that, so that is a spiritual and a real fact, but this present time that we're in is very interesting, and we'll try to touch on what we can, but let's continue where we were, right? This particular book right here, um, by uh, John G. Jackson, introduction by John Henry Clark. Many of you all probably know of it. It's called Introduction to African Civilization. Some people probably never even thought this was really African civilization. Well, it all began from what we can loosely call today African civilization. It should be more correctly Ethiopic civilization, but be this as it may, this book is a very, very important book. Now, how does this book connect with the Adis, the Adis Ahmet? We're moving into the time of the new year, as well as the time of so-called September 11th, September 11th. And this is a video that we want to, a vlog that we want to do and present, and hopefully we'll present that after this. The first thing was to remind our brothers and sisters that this year, September 11th, 2011 is not the Ethiopian New Year, but it is still a holy, a kedus time, as it is the eve, the eve of the New Year. You understand? It is the eve of the New Year. Mm. Uh, well, so now we were talking about Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, where it speaks about, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. You understand? Um, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. And now these lights in the firmament of the heavens are for a specific time-keeping purpose as it's revealed in 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. On the fourth day, this was revealed. The sun, the moon, and the stars become visible. That means they become seen. They become part of the ra'i. They become part of the re'e, the re, the re, or the re, the re. You understand the vision. You understand part of the vision. Now, this word re is interesting, and ra'i is interesting, and the word for shepherd also in the Ethiopic is connected with that. Now, we have also the word um, ra'a, or ra'a, 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 ra'a. That's evil. Ra'a is evil. The ra'a is evil in the Hebrew. Now, the re, the ra, the ra, or re, the re is the vision. The re is the seeing. So there's an important nuance and difference even in the Hebrew, in the Ibrayista Kwankwa, between seeing or vision and evil. And this is very interesting when we start to look at the, the, the semantics. People say, it's, it's, you, you're talking semantics. You know saying? You're talking semantics. You want reality. Don't talk. It's just, a, it's just a bunch of semantics. But the sem, the sim, the shem, the shem is very important. The name is very important because it says, blessed be the Lord God of the name. Those who don't want to deal with the true semantics, you understand, which means the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. You know that from, from Johannes or who you call John. John chapter 1 explains that in the beginning was the word. So those who don't deal with the word, they prove themselves spiritually to be kind of on Nawian, you understand, or Canaanites, and Canaanites are the lowlanders, you understand, the lowlanders, those who are enslaved, those who are slaves. Now, of course, this connects with this controversial part of the scripture in, in uh, Genesis chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, the conclusion of the Noahic covenant. Now, we're moving into a time where we also have to touch on and teach the Noahide, the Noahide laws. You understand? We as Rastafari are about the Noahide laws. Now, of course, you might hear or have heard that certain so-called Jews are also about the Noahide, you understand, what they call the Noahide commandments or Noahide laws. In fact, some say this has to do with this whole New World Order, so forth and so on. Well, it does. It does have a lot to do with the New World Order, but not in the way that they may want you to be like not in the way they may want you to believe. You understand? Without a knowledge. You see, without, the knowledge is so very important. The knowledge of the Bain Ha Elohim, the knowledge of the Son of God, is not just the, the exoteric, as our brother um, Bobby Hammett would teach, and some of you all may be familiar with his work, and we want to touch on some things that also touch on things that he has touched on and spoken about and things that we have been in to, as well as the Gnostic Gospels, because the word Gnostic, we have presented many videos where we've touched on certain aspects of the Gnosis, which means the knowledge, but yet Gnostic in the Western white European sense has been demonized, you understand, and the word Gnosis means knowledge, so why is knowledge demonized, because they don't want you to know the truth, because if you know the truth, or if you knew the truth, you would be free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what make you free. You understand? All that shittiness will come out of you. This is literally what it means, Bamarinya, in the Amharic. If we would go to the Amharic, it actually speaks about the Arnet, Mautat. You understand? And the word Ar, like in Arnet, has a lot to do with the the Ra, the Ra. The ra, the, the the evil, or the ra, ra. You understand? Uh, different than the re, re, re. As we said, means to see. Now, Jehovah Jireh. You familiar with that? Jehovah Jireh. You've heard certain Christians speak about Jehovah Jireh. Well, Jehovah Jireh. That is the divine. One of the divine um, formulations of the divine name. That it was said that Abraham. Were said, you understand, concerning the whole sacrifice of his son, um, his son Yisachak. 
you understand, that went to sacrifice his son Yisahak, and the son said, Daddy, Daddy, where is the, the sacrifice? And he said that God will provide, that the Lord will provide, or God will provide. He most likely said, um, El Shaddai, El Shaddai Yireh, because we know from Moses in Exodus that it was not known um, Yahweh was not known. He was not known by his name Yahweh, but by his name God Almighty or El Hail Hail Shaddai. You understand? God Almighty. You understand? Or El Shaddai. But the important part is the Yer A, the Yer A or Jaira name, because at this root, Re, Re, Re means to see. Now, Re. In the, in, in the Ethiopic and ancient Egypt was, is the true pronunciation of the one they called the sun god, falsely called and erroneously called the sun god was known as Array. Array. You understand? And that Array and the year Array or the Jaira was one and the same. And this brings us back to this, this, this same word that we're in concerning the vision. Now, the reason for pointing this out is that the semantics or the Shem is very important. So when we go to Genesis chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, we are reading about the conclusion of the Noahide or the Noahic, the Noah, Noch, Noch, Bamarinya is, and, and the good is, is Noch. Noch is where we get the word Anoch, 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 or Ankh, Ankh. Later on it will be spoken as Ankh. You understand? It's also spoken as Anach, Anach, Anoch, Anoch. You understand? And Noach means to extend for a very long time. You understand? It has the idea of long life or eternal life because the word is usually used in the good is in the sense of length, length, and length. Like mountains, if you read the Ethiopic Book of Jubilees and Enoch. And when you when one describes mountain, it uses that very same word or that root word a ne or no ch. You understand? A ne ch or a n and the k or k h sound or the the um, gurgling h like as in the bach bach. You understand? It uses that ach that particular sound that babies make. You see, babies know the divine when they when they're small. You hear babies gurgling. They say, "Oh, that's so cute. He's gurgling," and the or oh, she's gurgling. They, that that particular sound we have lost in the English, but that is part of the Ethiopic name of Noah, and it links with the Ankh. You understand that symbol from ancient Egypt of life. So here. The conclusion of the Noahic Covenant is speaking about a prophetic declaration. A prophetic declaration. Verse 24. And Noah, Noch, awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Curse be Canaan. Curse be Canaan, not curse be Ham. This is not a curse on black man and black woman and the black people because they're black as many of the counterfeit and the reprobate, the criminals who call themselves so-called Christians and Jews have said in order to justify falsely, you understand, um, in, to, to, to make self-righteous the enslavement of black people because of racial you understand discrimination and racial, racist, demonic reasons. But what was said in the scripture in verse 25 of Genesis chapter 9 in the Orit Ze Fitaret or Orit Ze Lidet, it says, And he said, Curse be Kanaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. And he said, verse 26, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Blessed be the Yahweh. Elohim of Shem or of the Shiyum, Shiyum Egeziyari here is one of the titles of his imperial majesty, Kedemawi Haile Selassie, and that particular title means the elect. So, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, Shiyum, and comes down to the word in Hebrew, in Ibrahim, that means name, the God of the name. Now, we also have a connection in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, there was a particular staff or a scepter that was known as the scepter of inheritance. 
that particular scepter known as the scepter of inheritance in ancient Gubit or ancient Koptos land or the Kemet is the, the scepter of the inheritor, the one who has the inheritance. And that's what's spoken of right here. So that's another link with the Ethiopic um, reconstruction of ancient Egypt and, per se, the Exodus. But we'll touch on that, Yah willing, what a feat. In, in the forwards, but blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. Then it says that Elohim shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of, of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. The important thing to realize, unlike what um, Europeans, um, Christians and Jews, or Jews, white, uh, Polish, and German, racist Jews, and Christians have asked, yuned, uh, have assumed it wasn't Ham, Shem, and Japheth in the way that they misinterpret that one was black, one was, was Asian, or olive complexion, and one was white. See, these colors were part of the mythos. They've confused the mythological, and they've tried to make it pseudo-historical. And in that, they have created an evil imagination where they say that, well, black people are cursed because they're black. That's the whole root, part of the, the, the essential hidden root of what's going on in this so-called post-racial society. And that's ha half of the story that they have not told you. So most people believe, be lie Eve, that when we talk about Ham, Shem, and Japheth, that we're talking about so-called three racial types as though Noah bore three different types of people, even though he must have been of one seed if Adam was black, according to the anthropology, you understand, of it. If, if the original man was black, and we know this because he came from the reddish-brown earth, and when we look at true natural earth in Africa and in even the Caribbean and down south, we see the color of the earth is that reddish-brown, and it has the very self-same complexion, as Ethiopic or as black people. So this is very, very important to distinguish, make a distinction between um, Ethiopic and Ethiopian, because Ethiopian, the terminology Ethiopian is very, quote, dubious today. You understand some so-called native Ethiopians don't really understand or understand what we mean over here in the West when we say Ethiopian. So it's a matter of education, you understand, but each one must take self um, responsibility for their education. If we have opportunity and time, we will, you know, teach and illuminate on that. But right now, we have to stay on the message. You understand the message right now. So the message right now is that Noah was black and his children were black too. Now, according to the mythological types that are used even in the book of Hanok or, or Enoch, as well as in the book of um, Little Genesis, or that's called Kufale, the Metzhafe Kufale, or the Book of Jubilees, but more so in the Book of Hanok, Enoch, it uses these types, the very same types that we find in ancient Egypt. You understand? The types of the, the zoology types, the animal types, as well as certain color types. One was a black bull, and one was a white bull, and one was a red bull. You understand? A red bull? Yeah, red bull. But this, this goes way back before this modern confusion that's known as Babylon. So you cannot try to um, reverse engineer from the confusion you're in today to try to understand what the ancients thought. You have to go back to the ancient thought and work your way back or forward, actually, forward ever, backward never, so to work our way forward. The only time you can work your way back from today is when you already know the way forward from yesterday. If you don't know the way forward from yesterday, you can't retrograde or, or, or retro refit, you know, reverse engineer like people would try to do, like a lot of Europeans and others try to take what the confusion and madness today and try to figure out yesterday. You have to go from yesterday's thought. Therefore, you have to have a, a new mind. You have to be born again because you cannot understand yesterday. It's foolishness to those who are worldly today. So to speak about these ancient things for most people, they get turned off. They're not even interested in what we have to say because they're caught up in the foolish madness of this end time. So be it. You understand? So be it for them. You allow them to go their way. But if you're into this and if you're interested, that means one has a heart and an ear, you understand, for the truth. Now, 
That being said, those who are not into the semantics, the, the shem antics or the shemantic, you understand, know of this are not into the word. Those who are into the semantics and understand that it's about the language and the interpretation of language, you understand, know that is key. It's like black folks. Black folks have a biblical way of speaking. Even in our lost state as a people, we have a biblical way. When we use words, we use words in a particular way, in a particular situation, a particular way that we say it. It means a particular thing. Some people will know what we mean in this way, while other people will think that we mean that in that way. But actually, these people know because, you know what I mean, there is a certain way we use words. You understand? As... I mean, it's very, it's slang, it's ghetto, it's hip-hop or whatever. These are just some expressions of how we have a poetical sort of way of speech that becomes pop or popular. You understand, a lot of things that black people, even the bounce and all these other things, become popular ways of expressing. So it's important for us to recognize that we as that soul people can express that soul in whatever language that we speak. Now, the key is this. When we are studying ancient times, most of us are not acquainted with the fact that black people were there, whether it's in ancient Egypt or ancient Greece or ancient Rome or ancient Babylon or any of these ancient civilizations. So when we are listening to people talk about the mythology and the interpretation of the symbology, so forth and so on, a lot of that is deranged because we're getting it from a lower land, a Canaanitish understanding of so-called white and Europeans, you know what I'm saying? And the majority, not all, but sadly the majority of them don't get it. There are those few that do get it, that have been blessed with, in a sense, the best that we can call it is soul. They got soul somehow, they get it. Yes, they are white or whatever like that, but they get it, you know what I'm saying? They, they get it. So those are the exceptions that prove the rule. You understand, the exceptions to the rule do not obliterate the rule, but those exceptions actually prove that the rule is true. So, curse be Kana'an, and blessed be the Lord God of what? Of who? Of Shem, of the name, of the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So that's, that's important to understand, and this is just, just to explain what, how and why the semantics is very important. Now, on this other side, this now is, as we said, the Shabbat time, Saturday, you understand, the Sabbath. But unfortunately, ones are not into the true Sabbath, the true sabbatical. Most folks, you probably know, and so forth and so on. Some of you might even be listening to this and be out there partying and drinking and so forth and so on. And let me check out something on the Internet, and you check out this video, perhaps. You understand? But they don't want us, as Umar Abdullah Johnson said in a recent video that we've seen with uh, Professor Griff, they don't want us thinking. They don't want us thinking or, or in a, a, a sober, you understand, know state on the Sabbath. You understand? Know and this is why the Sabbath really begins from Friday evening. So those who are used to and are into going out there and partying, and so and a lot of us used to do that. Sad, uh, Friday night comes along, we're looking for the nearest party. We're looking for the nearest session or dance hall or something. And, and, and we're so caught, we look forward. In fact, most folks look forward to the so-called weekend or thank God, TGIF, thank God it's Friday. But unfortunately, the, 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 the Sabbath, that's the witch's Sabbath. That's the witch's Sabbath. That, that is the occultic and the evil um, observation of the Sabbath. Now, this particular Sabbath right now, because of being, it's being September 9th and with the events of 9-11, September 11th, and this is 9-11 plus 10, 10 years later, so forth and so on, it, 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 is, it is something altogether even, even more um, different, but I'm trying to find a word. It, 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 is, it is like more emphatic even today because of the events going on. So a lot of people are probably going to party and then hope to also party for the September 11th and say down to terrorists, so forth and so on. But what is terror? You understand? And, and who really is the master of terrorism? You see what I'm saying? But the lost sheep, the lost sheep and the, and the devil, the children of disobedience, they don't, they don't have any part of the truth. So this truth falls on their deaf ears. Their deaf ears cannot hear. Their blind eyes cannot see. 
you understand, and they're unable to articulate this particular truth, you understand, or even to receive it. But it's important for us to understand Genesis 1 and 14, as well as the Noahide link, you understand, and the Noahide. So this message basically was about the Noahide and the shamantics or the, or blessed be Lord God of, 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 of Shem and the importance of the um, semantics, you understand, which is the word and understanding the word. But we're still continuing on the Ad- Adi Samet, as well as we touched on um, briefly um, the Sabbath, because it's a Sabbath, and, and this is the ninth, and tomorrow is the, is the tenth, you understand, which is going to be the eve of September 11th, which is Sunday, you understand. And then for us, normally, or rather usually, for the other three years out of the four, on average, besides a leap year, this is a leap year, September 11th, you understand, would be our Ethiopian New Year, also known as the Addis Ahmed, you understand, also known as, let's see if we can put this here, as the Addis Ahmed, as the Addis Ahmed, but this year it's not the Addis Ahmed on the 11th, rather, however, on the other hand, the greater hand, it is September 12th. 2011. So that that in and of itself, because we were somewhere, and tell the, tell the truth, we was somewhat a little bit displeased. We said, look, they've already, the New World Order, they've already been able to, in a sense, um, superimpose their thought. You understand? Their, their thought. And it's important to understand how they do this. We saw this article in this particular, this particular uh, paper right here, The Danger of the Occult. They have it half right, you understand, half right, you understand, more so than most uh, Christians and, and European Judeo, um, Judeo-Christian folks. They had this article right here, 9-11 plus, plus 10. So we read this particular article. It was a very interesting article, um, albeit kind of a recap of what's going on and, and – um, you know, Obama and, and stuff like that. Not negative about Obama. They're, more, they're, they're a little more sober as um, Christians, you understand, as Christians go. But they didn't have a real good explanation of 9-11 plus 10 in the real prophetical sense. Yah has given us a understanding of that. But it was this article right here before it where it says prophecy comes alive. You can see this right here, prophecy Prophecy comes alive, and there you see the anbet, uh, or they, they, they you see the, the locust, the flying locust, or the helicopter, Chinook, or whatever other kind of name they want to call that helicopter. But in this, it talks about the homosexual agenda. It talks about what's happening in America, right? And also talks about how these two top um, homos, uh, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen, about 20 years ago, how they engineered you understand, through using psychological techniques, through using psychological techniques, how they engineered this, um, this homosexual type of revolution, you understand, where they, a couple of key, key words and phrases that they um, utilize in this particular article, we should have highlighted it, um, but we didn't, um, that it was a planned psychological attack, a planned psychological attack, Kirk and Madsen said that we mean conversion, conversion of America, or some could call it perversion or deception, of <coughs> average Americans' emotions, of the average American emotions, mind, and will through a planned psychological attack in the form of propaganda fed to the nation through the media, through the media. So they spoke about even things that they would actually, um, the techniques. We found this article to be very, very informative because it was, a, it was a short summary of the kind of techniques that they would use, the type of psychological techniques that they would use in order to um, change. Right here, let's just share this. is about 20 years ago. Um, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen 
two Harvard University educated homosexual activists developed a plan to use the power of social marketing and public persuasion tactics to challenge and change fundamental Western views and added to views and values, views and values, and they practice a, a type of a programming that's called unabashed, unabashed propaganda, unabashed. No, they're not ashamed. To if you figure this propaganda, say yes, that's right, it's propaganda. Firmly, that's that's firmly grounded in long established principles of psychology and advertising. So by looking at the new normal, the, the so-called new normal in connection. You understand with the so-called homosexual agenda. And this is one reason why when you look at their flag, we've been telling the brothers and sisters, especially the Ethiopian Brotherhood, the Ethiopic Brotherhood, the Rastafari, we've been telling them that our flag does not have red on top. And it's very important that you see the homosexual flag has red up on top. You understand? But a lot of ones want, want to be hardheads. You understand? They want to be hardheads. And they said a hard head makes for a soft. Anyway, you get it. So this article was very interesting as well, you know, the deception of America by how they've been using these kind of techniques. And when we now read this article and look over what we've been seeing and witnessing over the last 20 years, it is very true. So a lot of folks will say, yes, this is what I am because I was born that way, but they haven't found no gay genes, so forth and so on. But in the very same way they use these psychological techniques, right, that are long established, that if you keep drilling somebody with this sort of information and they keep getting it from all sides, they'll begin to, the average person's emotions, mind, and will, and their willpower will be forced to comply or into a compliance. And this is the very same thing they've done with, with the whole Saturday partying, excuse me, partying on a Saturday and going out and, and living a certain so-called lifestyle where people think that they have really made a conscious choice, you understand, but they've only had a limited amount of choices anyway, so the decision basically is, is, is from bad or worse, but they never had the good choice. The, the true opportunity was suppressed and was hidden from them. So we thought that this also was very interesting. We'll touch on this article from um, today's world, the September, October 11th, of today's world. So in order to catch up with where we should be right now with this particular region, we want to talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You understand? Um, some call this the four living creatures. Some say the beasts, which are around the throne of God, which is imaged with the Almighty, with that picture of the Almighty or the Trinity, the triune. The triune, what's interesting that they talk about some attack that might be likely, you understand, to happen, you understand, in New York. And they said looking for three men. And in the earlier versions of the, the four living creatures, they, in some Christians would show like three men that look the same way. You understand? And they would say that's the Trinity or that's one way, like a, kid, a kindergarten kind of explanation of the Trinity. Um, if we had the video, we'll show you or, or the still. We don't have the video at this time or still to show you, but we'll definitely get that to you. Most of you will probably know what we're talking about from the Ethiopian picture of the Trinity. Just look up Ethiopian Trinity on the Google, and you'll probably see this picture of these three men that look the same way, you understand, now who are gesturing. And then in the, in the bigger picture, you will see at the four corners, it looks something like this. And then it will have these, these four so-called living creatures or beasts that are pointed to in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Now, Ethiopically, you understand, according to our or our calculation of time, our counting and calculation of time, every year since the coming of our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from an Ethiopic or original Christian perspective would be named after one of these four um, evangelists or Wengelawites, evangelists, either Mateos, known as Matthew, Marcos, known as Mark, Luke, us, known as Luke, Johannes, known as John. Now, this also, this also conforms, it is said, to something that is very ancient. And, and, and let us share just a little bit of this with you. In ancient Egypt, they were known as the so-called, um, the four gods, the four gods that hold up the heavens. 
This is why we had to focus on Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, to understand the biblical, the biblical or the Hebraic context. You understand, the fourth day was when the sun, the moon, and stars become visible. And Elohim said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day, which is the illuminated times, from the night or the shadow state or the unilluminated times, and let them, these particular lights, be, let them be for signs. Let them be for certain signs and for seasons and for days and for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth to give light or illumination, not just light like a light that you have in your room or your house or street lights, you understand, but these lights, the light in that sense would be the illumination. Let them be to reveal, you understand, reveal the, the, um, the seasons, the days, the years, how to calculate time. And we already touched on the link with calculation of time, in, in the natural or the God-created way of life. But most people in the cities and the cities, what you're in, when we, li when we live in cities, we're living in a man-made man kind of matrix, and the men who control or the rulers who rule that city, they are the gods of that city. So like in New York, Bloomberg is the, the god of the city. And it's important to understand that. They know these things, and they're Freemasonic, so forth and so forth. They understand they know these things, you understand? And they practice their way of governance in this exact sort of way. Everything is basically controlled by them until there's a natural disaster. You see, and when there's a natural disaster, then we get to see that these gods, these are earthbound gods. These are not gods that created heaven and earth, you understand, or gods who are the children of the true God of gods, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're not those, the, the true God, you understand, because it's, I've said ye are gods. But they have thrown us into this, this, this darkness, this pit, this confusion, you understand, of mind where we don't know ourselves. In fact, we actually, our ancestors got ourselves into that through disobedience. But the iniquity of the Gentile is not yet full, or of the Amorite is not yet full. So these are some of the signs right here from ancient Egypt. This is the so-called Zodiac from ancient Egypt. You understand the original Zodiac that Musa, that Moses, who wrote the five books of the Bible, you understand, and the prophets were familiar with this paradigm. You understand their prophecies and what they wrote about was in this context and not in this um postmodern, white, Western, European, Gentile way of looking at it. For example, in Egypt, it was the cat. In the Greek, it's the ram. In other words, in Egypt, it was a jackal. In the Greek, it's the bull. In Egypt, it was a serpent. In the Greek, it's the twins. In Egypt, it was the scarab or the beetle. In the Greek, it's the crab. In Egypt, it was the ass. In the Greek, it was the lion. In Egypt, it was the lion. In Greek, it was the virgin. In Egypt, it was the goat. In Greek, it was the scales. In Egypt, it was the cow. In Greek, it was the scorpion. In Egypt, it was the falcon. In Greek, it was the arch. In Egypt, it was the baboon. And in Greek, it was the goat. In Egypt, it was the ibis or the ibis, the hebis. In Greek, it was the waterman. In Egypt, it was the crocodile. In Greek, it was the fishes. And in uh, John G. Jackson's book, he has this um, listed right here. But there's also a side to real. If you notice that, that when zemins or ages have changed, there's also a, a, a change of the celestial dial. You see there's a change of the celestial dial. And now we use the square, which is 360 degrees, to map out that circle of the heavens. And so these four gospel or evangelists are used in the Hadith Kidan sense you understand, to interpret or project that ancient root meaning. For example, it says right here that the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian sphinx, or the, the Hor, the Hor M uh, Aket, as it was known, Hor M Aket, um, the Egyptian phoenix, a colossal statue, statue, sacred to the sun god Horus, or Kheri, 
was erected at least 6,000 years ago. They would tell you that no, it was erected, uh, you know, anyway. Um, but at least at least 6,000. Some say 10,000. We say it's more like 10,000 B.C., if not 13,000. You understand? During, actually, it was first mapped out and squared in the last era of, of human beings on the, on the face of this earth, not in this present era. In other words, that's like 10,000, 10 to 13,000 years ago. And the Bible actually, the, the, the missing verses from Genesis that are found in Jeremiah actually point that out. You understand? Point that out. There was a great destruction. You understand? That took over all the earth, and there was a few, there was a remnant even from that. Some say it might have been with the fall of the angels and, and the whole dispositioning of the constellation. Others might say it happened around the great flood, so forth and so on. But this particular sphinx, or the Horem Aket, or the Harem Aket, Harem Maket, it has the body of a lion. Some say a lion. Others say it was actually an Anup or a dog if you look at the body, but most believe it has the body of a lion. Emblematic, perhaps, of the entrance of the sun into the zodiacal sign of the lion around 4000 B.C. Now, if you're looking, some of the Bibles have dates. This one doesn't have the dating in it. Some of the other Bibles have certain dates and would say that Genesis, what, what Genesis is speaking about was about 4004. Some say that was 4004. So basically, it, it would be um, four, four years after that would be 4000 B.C., right? But the Temple of the Sphinx is constructed in the form of a cross. The thing that one doesn't understand by looking at it just, just from the, the horizontal position, because they can't understand it vertically, that the Temple of the Sphinx is constructed in the form of a cross. And it symbolizes north south, east, and west, or the cardinal points of the celestial sphere. In other words, the cardinal points of the celestial square. So what we have is something like, for example, if you say a cross, right, if you say the celestial sphere, and then you square it, you have something to this effect. This is kind of small, but you have something to this effect in order to square it. And then you can also further do this, and then you further do that, and you have what's often called the eight-pointed. If you look at this, it has the eight-pointed or the octagon, which is also the two squares right here, which is also the very same shape that this new freedom tower called now the One World Center is to have. In other words, this tower that they're building for the 9 11 memorial, the new building at the One World Trade Center, whatever like that, it basically has this same, they have incorporated the same idea in it. That's why they keep saying that the 10th anniversary is so very important to them. They need to have the 10th anniversary of the 9 11, and they need to have the memorial pool, the metasebia, the reminder, the remembrance. If we look at this in our Ethiopic way, actually, it is on, um, I mean, this is a time of today, actually, today, the 9th, is what is known as, let's pull this up right here, the 9th is what is known as Yekdusan, um, Yekdusan and Yekdusan, in other words, the holy man and the holy woman. This is a memorial time today, is a memorial time for the holy ones. The Holy One within our Hebraic and Christian, you understand? Um, it says, Yekdusan in Yekdusad Hulu Metasebia. Today is a, a, a remembrance, and the New Year is also a remembrance. Tomorrow, some say, tomorrow is, the, um, is for the Prophet Amot, the, the, the tenth, the Shabbat of the tenth is for the Prophet Amot. And then when we go to um, Bagume Asara'and, or we go to the Agume, the 13th Ethiopic month, is Nisaha Tzom Mabkiya. This is also a time of fasting. These uh, five to six days from the Ethiopic perspective has been a time of fasting because of these, there's 13 months of sunshine. Ethiopia is known as the 13 months of sunshine. So the 13th month has five days. But in leap years like this, 
it has actually six days. And this is a particular um, Nishad's home. Megbiyah began on the first. You understand? The first, which would have been, what was that? Um, um, Tuesday began on the sixth, which you know as the sixth. But Pagume And began the Nishad's home. You understand? Or the fast of repentance. And on Sunday would be the Mabkiyah or the fulfillment, the, the ending of this particular nisha, psalm, repentance, you understand, repentance fast. And then for us as Ethiopic Hebrews and as true Ethiopians, it would be the eve of Ethiopian New Year, which, which is the 12th. So Monday is very important. Monday is a holiday or a holy day for us. But it's interesting how it's side the real of th what they're doing in the West and what, and what the Gentiles are doing with 9-11. You understand? So it helps us to be in the world but not of the world. So we are in their world, you understand, but we're not of their world so, because we can overstand, not just understand and receive whatever they give us, but then to overstand it in our own way, from our own root, under our own vine, and under our own fig tree. So let them walk in the name of their gods, but we'll walk in the name of Yahweh, El Elohe Israel. You understand? You hear the screeching? You hear the screeching demons? Yep, they're out there. You understand? But now to continue... The Temple of the Sphinx is constructed in the form of a cross and symbolizes the north, south, east, and west. The north, south, east, and west. North, south, east, and west. Right? So you can draw a cross over that, and then you can also ha have like um, um, north, north, uh, north, northeast, and northwest, and, you know, the other little, little not little, but, but other increments of, um, of, of directions. You understand, between like north and, you know, between north and east, there is northeast. You know what I mean? Between east and, and, and south, there is southeast or something to that effect. All right? So these are the cardinal points of the celestial, the heavenly sphere, the heavenly circle. The two solstices and the two equinoxes. So this, this eight, this octagon or this octagon shape, or this right here, this symbology right here, where the corners are squared, we can say, also implies the octagon, although it is not fully, is not fully demonstrated here. You understand? By shape, mathematically, those who are initiated understand that this is also like this, that this right here is just like this. You understand? So it's important to, to, to understand that as well. So it seems that there were originally only four signs of the zodiac, that originally it seems, according to John G. Jackson, that there were only four signs of the zodiac, namely the quarter signs at the solstices and, and equinoxes. So there was only the cross points or those that form the sign of the cross. You understand the unilateral, trying to make it as even as possible, the unilateral cr cross. They were only at, at these particular points right there, of the plus sign, you can say, the plus sign, right? Saint George St. Clair, an able student of astrotheological mythology, has made some illuminating comments concerning the original four zodiacal signs from which we quote the following. About 6,000 years ago, the spring sun would be entering Taurus. About 6,000 years ago, the spring sun will be entering Taurus, and the four quarter signs would be the bull, the lion, the scorpion, and the waterman. Though some of these signs might be otherwise named, they might be otherwise imaged, you understand, and named, or, or shimmed, shimmed. In memory of that early arrangement, which in many ways left its mark, devices on rings were, for example, a scorpion, a lion, a hawk, and a cynocephalus ape, or what they call the baboon, or the African, the Ethiopian, um, you know, the, the, there's that, um, I think the baboon that has the red heart, 
that, that had the red heart. Some might have seen it in videos. Some might have seen it actually if they went to Ethiopia. You understand? From the four quarters, we passed to the 12 signs. So, so we've been talking about 12, remember, and we talk about seven. Now, from from the um, it said right here that from from the four quarters, the four quarters, one, two, three, four, we pass to the what? The 12 signs. Between each two quarter signs, two other signs were inserted. This is what we've been trying to explain here with the octagonal shape. You understand? Or the fitret rucha. The fitret rucha. You understand? Or the, the, the wheel or the race of creation, the course of creation. The race of creation, so to speak, right? The quarter signs, right? The planisphere of the temple of Dendara, it shows four gods or Elohim supporting the heavens at the four quarter points. This is what Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 8 is speaking in the context of as well. Supporting the heavens at the four quarter points corresponding to the bull, the lion, the scorpion, and the water man, right? And shows eight other divinities in pairs, one on either side of each pillar, making up the twelve. And this was from uh, creation records discovered in Egypt, pages 136 to 137 by George St. Clair. Now, the four gods, what's called the Elohim. And it's interesting because when we look in the Bible, the biblical, especially in the earlier books by our Coptic Hebrew brother Musa, who was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and the man mighty in the word, in the Shem, in the word, as well as in the deed, you understand? It is interesting that he also is speaking in that context when we're looking in the earliest portions of the Hebraic Bible, the four gods or the Elohim that hold up the heavens were recognized in Egyptian mythology or in the Kamite mysteries as the four children of the sun god Cherui. Now we know that the name Cherui, we know now that Cheru is actually an Ethiopian, an Ethiopic name that still is even used in Ethiopia among Ethiopians at home and abroad even to this very day. And the name means the elect or the chosen, the chosen. So when it says the sun god the Elohim Horus, we need to reconstruct um, that as Cheru. And their names were Amset, Hapi, Tuam, Tuamutef, and Geb, Geba, Geba Senuf, Geba Senuf, right? These four Amentes, Amentes or, or the genie of Hades, or some would even call them the mains in that sense, were depicted as standing at the cardinal points of the celestial sphere and holding up the heavens. This is also pointed out in the book of Hanok, the Ethiopic book of Enoch as well. Each deity or Elohim, member of the Elohim, was identifiable by his particular features as listed before, below. So it says they were identifiable. Now, I want you to understand this in terms of Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. The living creatures, the four gospels, and the living creatures. That's very much important in understanding this connection with the September 11th and the Addis Ahmed of the 12th. This difference, as, as we're witnessing it right now and about to go through, between 2003 to 2004, Ameta Meheret, or AM, in the Ethiopian AM. This means the morning time could win the new millennium. But for Westerners in the Gregorian calendar, it's just 2001 to 2001. There's no difference besides it being for the, the memorial events of the 9-11 and the World Trade Center um, terroristic and so-called attacks and all of that. Now, Amset had the head of a man. And we read this in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Hopi, it possessed the head of an ape. Well, this is a little bit different, but we'll go a little deeper and we'll find it. Tua, tua or Tuamutef, Tuamutef was adorned by the head of a jackal in ancient Egypt. Gabith, Gabith Senuf, he wore on his shoulders the head of a hawk. 
he wore on his shoulders now the head of a hawk. And we see this picture as well, and this is very iconic, like somebody having like a bird on their shoulder, so to speak. They got that out of inner Africa, out of Egypt. Now, these same, now later on, and this, a lot of this is because of, you know, we're, going, we're, getting, we're going through like white people's way of thinking and trying to reconstruct it according to the truth. So we're going to use these kind of terminologies that we like to put a footnote right there when it says like these same sky gods. I mean, they were sky gods, but not in the, not in the make be lie Eve that they tell you about it today. Because, see, they, they have a lot of make be lie Eve in order to keep you away from that and to keep you within the, the prepackaged programming, you understand, of the, of the Gentile world system or of, of Babylon. These same sky gods are referred to in the, quote, Bible, end quote, more than once, although the symbols are different. Now, there's a very important reason for the symbols being changed, because who knows when the original Dendera symbols came into usage. But one thing is known that the heavens, as time goes on, the heavens rotate. Over thousands of years, the heavens rotate. So ones in Egypt had witnessed these things over a vast long time because now we have these technology computers and now they can map where position of stars was hundreds or, or even in some cases thousands of years ago. That wasn't, they weren't able to do that before. But now what they're finding out is that the ancient Egyptians were miraculously to them accurate with, with celestial timekeeping how can I say this? Yet you could not know these things. In other words, in the West, they did not know these things until they had, had bigger and better computers, you understand, and they gathered a lot of the knowledges of other civilizations, and when they put that into their computers, now the computers can go back in time and prove that the Egyptians were able to map time over literally um, thousands, some, in some cases tens of thousands, some even say maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, or they had this as a repository. So the only way somebody could know where the stars was like 13,000 years ago was that they witnessed this 13,000 years ago, because how could they only be created 4,000 years later, you understand, and then be able to develop a language and know where stars was and say, yes, this star was actually there, there 4,000 years ago, unless they or another one of their kind was there to witness these actual events. You understand? So this also shows that ancient civilization is far older, and black civilization, Ethiopic civilization is far older than they want to make us believe. For most niggas, history began with coming to America, coming to America, you remember that? Yeah, that's where history began for them, for most Negroes, because they want to keep us in this lost sheeple state, because they want the sheeple to be led to the proverbial slaughter, you understand, the slaughter to their gods, their, their, their demonic gods, or the god, actually, of this world, who is Satan, biblically speaking. So these symbols were different. Now, in the Bible, they were called Kirubim. These were called cherubim, the cherubim in the Bible. These were called the cherubim in the Bible. It's very important to keep that in mind, the kirub, the kirub, like kepra, kirub, right? These celestial creatures were seen by Ezekiel or Hizkiel in a vision, in a rai, in a vision, the rai, the re, you understand, which he had while in Babylon while he was in Babylon or some say Iraq, southern Iraq or northern Iraq, somewhere over in the Iraqi region. Quote, cool. this is Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they had four. They four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four had the face of an eagle. So we're getting man we're getting lion, we're getting ox, and we're getting eagle. This is very much similar to what Revelation 4, 6 to 8 also says. Now, in the Apocalypse, or what's known as um, Ye Johannes Rai, or Revelation, or the vision of Johannes, Yah's grace, we read about the four beasts, 
or the living creatures. In the book of Revelation chapter 4 verse 7, we are told that the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf and the third beast had a face had a face as man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. These beasts were the constellations situated at the four cardinal points of the zodiac 5,000 years ago. They were Taurus, firstly Taurus the bull, which is the vernal equinox, Leo the lion, the summer solstice, Scorpio, the scorpion, the autumnal equinox, and Aquarius, or Aquarius, the waterman, which is the winter solstice. So now, where are we now? You understand? Where are we now? You see, where are we now? Is this, are we in the time of the scorpion right now? In the Bible, the eagle had been substituted for the scorpion. In the Bible, the eagle is substituted for the scorpion. So, so the eagle now is substituted for the scorpion. Now, this is in, important to understand about the 9-11 and what's being witnessed and why it's so important for them to get it right right now. Because if the eagle has been substituted for the scorpion, think about this for a moment. The eagle is a symbol of America, too. You see what I'm saying? So we have the eagle. And, and, and this is all circulating around this junction point right now. You see this junction point, September 11th, September 12th, and the Ethiopian New Year? It's very, very important in the, in the four Gospels. Now, going, going further, we learn from the erudite Godfrey Higgins that, quote, the signs of the zodiac, with the exception of the scorpion, was exchanged by Don, by the tribe of Don, which some say is the Beta Israel, the Ethiopian Falasha, you know, the Falasha of the East, for the eagle, were carried by the different tribes of the Israelites, the, the Beta Israel, on their standards. So they, tra they, they carry the Serek, the Serek, like in ancient Egypt, the Serek. We don't have room to put it up right here, but where they carry their particular icon or their logo, their tribal logo, know your tribal logo, was carried by the different tribes of the Israelites on their standard. And Taurus, Leo, Aquarius, and Scorpio, or the eagle, the four signs of Reuben, Judah, Ephraim, Don, were placed at the four corners. So you see, this is also very important to understand this symbol of the Ancient of Days as well as these tribes, as well as the link with what's going on right now and who we be. So we need to understand, because we cannot, this is the way to come out of Babylon. You said, first of all, you have to come out in your spirit, in, in your mind, be born again, you understand, in the spirit of your mind. Don't be conformed to the world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it's a spiritual, it's a mental, it's a mental ascent, because if your spirit and your soul doesn't come up to the proper standard, or level, you're never going to be able to overcome the flesh or the cardinal, which is the body, either your body being dependent on your body or being dependent on somebody else's body. You understand? And this is where we're at right now. You understand? Um, where people are not even just dependent on their own body, but other people's bodies, if you understand. So these were places, the four corners, the, the four cardinal points of their encampment. And they said that evidently in allusion to the cardinal points of the seer or of the, the heavenly circle, the cipher of the heavens, the equinoxes and solstices when the equinox was in Taurus. This is when the equinox was in Taurus. But something amazing is happening, especially as we're going into, what is it, 2012. We're going into 2012 right now, and the earthquakes, the storms, the floods, is because the earth is rebalancing the magnetics are also withdrawing in order to cause the movers to move the earth and to put the earth bring the earth out of this 23 degree axis so it can align with the central primordial sun this is where we're coming to right now so this also explains now at a higher level the floods and other kind of happenings you understand but you won't hear about this in the media because they do not admit the truth they are into make be lie ease. 
you know what I'm saying, to make believe. So it's important to understand this connection here. It goes on even much, much more, but this is kind of a basic kind of foundation, a basic foundation to what we are speaking about here with these particular four Gospels. Now, we can go to the next level of this and explain and explicate how these four, these four Gospels, right, how these four Gospels are Mateos, Marcos, Luke, Os, and Johannes, which now equals these four cardinal points and the four tribes, you understand, how there's the heavenly connection, you understand, how we're going through a realignment now as we're going into 2012, and this is what's having the push and the pull with the magnetics changing, the magnetics repositioning on, on the waters and the storms and the fires and the floods. So one shouldn't really take these things personal, really. It's not really so much personal, but it's that ones and ones have invested in their man-made cities, and the cities must fall, according to the Bible, according to the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, or Jesus Christ, the cities must fall because the cities viewed from heaven are a cancer on the face of the earth. You understand? Because the pollution, because of the wickedness, the crime and violence, and, the, and, and their, that's what the Bible says, that their iniquity, their wickedness has reached heaven. You understand? And right now is the time of it reaching to heaven. You understand? It's, it's, it's reaching, as we can even see this, this correspondence right here, September 11th, the Ethiopian New Year Eve. And this year, the year of Johannes or John, Ethiopian New Year, the Addis Ahmed, September 12th, or Meskaram Ant. So stay tuned. There's some more to come. We're going to take this, uh, we'll give you a moment to take this down because we're going to clear this whiteboard right here so we can continue with the next part of this very important um, New Year's. We call this the New Year's series. There's, there's, there's a series of teachings and updates that has been placed on our heart and in our mind that we want to share with those of you who are willing and able to receive. So once again, Shalom Ras Tefari and Shabbat Shalom Senbet Salam.